Hello everyone and welcome to another cross-domain correlation video. For those of you who are new members or just haven't had a chance to check the other cross-domain correlation videos in the members portal, cross-domain correlation or CDC is a technique I used a lot during the final weeks of my exam. And, and uh, I just want to go on the record and say that I'm pretty sure I invented this and I coined the term cross-domain correlation, you know, study in theory, Luke Ahmed, CISSP, that's me. If uh, if you have a month or less left before you take the exam, by now you should really know everything there is to know, right? Anything else you are reading should just be for review. No concept should be foreign to you right now. So with CDC, what I do is flip to any page in the Sean Harris 7th edition, any domain, any page, any chapter, and land on a topic. And whatever topic it is, I will then flip to another random page in another domain and try to relate the topic from the first domain. Uh, listening back to what I just said, it sounds super confusing, so let me just go ahead and begin. Maybe the demonstration will help a little bit more. Now, I usually randomly flip for the first topic, but this time, for the first time, I'm actually going to pick it myself. And I'm going to pick IPsec because it is such an important topic to understand, and it's here somewhere. Um, IPsec is in the network security domain, domain 4, and it can get really technical, it can really get into the weeds there. But hopefully I'll be able to show you that while IPsec is technical in nature, it really has a stronghold in every other domain in the CISSP CBK, in the CISSP common body of knowledge. Yep, there it is, there's Internet Protocol Security, IPsec. What is IPsec again? At a high level, IPsec is for securely transporting data in motion Ah, that sounded weird. Let me try. Let me start that again. At a high level, IPsec is for securely transporting data in motion from one point to another through an unsecured medium like the internet. If you want to keep your data hidden on the internet and securely communicate from your computer to another network, IPsec VPNs will allow you to do that with like 99.999% confidence that it will stay secure. It's going to stay confidential. IPsec is really strong encryption, and IPsec isn't just like a single protocol like SSH or HTTPS, IPsec is an entire suite of protocols. It's composed of a whole bunch of security protocols like a lot of symmetric algorithms, hashing algorithms, and the different Diffie-Hellman groups. Like with IPsec you can use the symmetric encryption algorithms like AES-256, DES, triple DES, or hashing algorithms like SHA-1, MD5, or Diffie-Hellman groups 2 and 5. You can use all these things to encrypt your data. All this comes together to form a deeply secure connection from one point to another through which you can send some of the most sensitive of data. So yeah, uh, IPsec is a huge part of security and one that should be known pretty well. If you want to see how an IPsec VPN tunnel is built, I do a slight demonstration in the video where I talk about symmetric encryption. It's in Domain 3 security engineering videos in the members portal. Um, yeah, so let's let's finally get started with this cross-domain correlation video about IPsec. And as stated, uh, we've picked IPsec as our starting point, and now we're going to go pick a random topic in domain 1. So we're going to try and correlate IPsec to something we randomly pick in domain 1. So here's domain 1. And in domain 1, we're just going to randomly flip through a bunch of pages, go up and down, randomly flip through, see if we can find someone that we can work with. Um, how's procedures? Okay. Uh, okay, procedures. Okay, we can work with this, I think. Procedures goes along with um, baselines, guidelines, standards, and policies. And yes, you do have to know these terms for the exam. Just a quick review in case you didn't. Policies are high-level documents. Guidelines are suggestive, not required standards make sure everything is the same across the enterprise and baselines establish a normal behavior and any deviations uh, from this behavior can be measured either positively or negatively so how does ipsec relate to procedures let's see um, i'll just use my own example in in my real life a network security engineer uh, that's what i do for a living can write up a procedure to go step by step on how to implement an ipsec vpn I mean, that's what I do at my job at least twice a week. IPsec is a complicated thing to set up and configure on a firewall or a router. So sometimes we need new, our new security engineers to follow procedures initially and exactly. Otherwise, any deviation can cause an outage or a firewall down or cause something else not to work or cause a SysP term interdependency not to work. But once you build enough of them, it becomes easier. 
So as far as IPsec and procedures, how they relate, you can have procedures to configure an IPsec VPN tunnel. Okay, that's that's how I can think of the uh, they relate. Hey, hey, wait a second. Oh shit! Oh sorry, didn't mean to swear. I'll edit that in the final video, or you know what? Maybe I'll leave it in. We're all adults here. Yeah, look at this third paragraph here in procedures. It says uh, to tie these items together. Let's walk through an example. A corporation's security policy indicates the confidential information should be properly eh, supporting standard. Oh wow! It says. Uh, uh, a supporting standard mandates that all customer information held in databases must be encrypted with AES while it is stored and that it cannot be transmitted over the internet unless IPsec encryption technology is used. Oh wow, I was just I was just talking about this. I swear this is random. I didn't know procedures was gonna talk about this. Wow, this is exactly what I just said from our real life. The standard indicates what type of protection is required and provides that level of granularity. Yeah. So they're talking about IPsec in procedures. See, IPsec is so involved in all the CISP, CBK domains. We see an example of IPsec being mentioned here in domain one, even though we picked IPsec in domain four. four. Wow, that just blew my mind. This IPsec, we just happened to be talking about that, and they just, the paragraphs is in there. And I just talked about AES 256.2, symmetric uh, algorithms and all that. Wow, that was crazy. Okay. Well, th there, you ha there you have it. IPsec, how it applies to procedures, a random topic I just picked right in front of you. Uh, in this video and how IPsec uh, relates to it right there you have it right there that was crazy I doubt that will happen again in domain 2 let's go to domain 2 and I'm just gonna flip through a bunch of pages and see where I kind of land uh, how about right about uh, somewhere around here a heading uh, endpoint DLP okay we landed at endpoint DLP DLP stands for data loss prevention Endpoint data loss prevention, um, it prevents compromise of data at rest and data in use and not data in motion, which is what IPsec is used for. Uh, so how does IPsec relate to DLP? I guess after an IPsec packet is decrypted, the sensitive data is once again in plain text, right? If IPsec goes across uh, the internet, it has to be decrypted somewhere because it's encrypted. So once it's decrypted and on a server, it needs endpoint data loss prevention, endpoint DLP, to guarantee the endpoint that it's decrypted on, like the server or some machine, is secured. Let's go with that. Right, so IPsec packet gets decrypted because IPsec is for data in motion, and you need endpoint DLP to secure data at rest. That very same data you sent over the internet, once it gets decrypted, also needs to be secured. So you use endpoint DLP for that. Hey, they're not all going to be winners, okay? We got really lucky with the first one. It just nailed it right there with procedures. Uh, that's the best I can do for endpoint DLP as it relates to IPsec. Okay, let's try domain three, security engineering. And let's just quickly pick a page here, and we'll start with uh, how about buffer overflow? Okay, buffer, okay, yeah. I can relate this to IPsec, I think. Buffer overflow occurs when a flow of data exceeds the space of a memory buffer, if I recall correctly. And that's really what the cause of denial services are. To have a, uh, sorry, not the cause, the result of a denial service. To have a buffer means you have allocated a limited amount of space to something. And when, the, usually like memory or cache or something like that. And when this, or a NIC card or something like that. When this space gets filled up, then things start to go crazy. And that's how denial service attacks and all that kind of things happen. How does this relate to IPsec? Um, well, IPsec packet is heavy. Um, and IPsec might actually create a buffer flow um, and actually cause a denial of service because an IPsec packet is encrypted, right? We can all agree on that. IPsec is encrypted. The data and the different segments of an IPsec packet, well, all this, is, uh, all this contains a lot of encryption, a lot of hashing, and a lot of Diffie-Hellman mathematical calculations. And it makes IP, um, an IPsec packet really heavy. Um, it's a bigger packet than a normal plain text packet. You know, if you Google a uh, regular TCP packet, you'll see the diagram of it. And, but if you Google a uh, IPsec, IPsec packet, you'll see a lot more uh, added information, a lot more segments to that packet. Um, it's a bigger packet than normal, and it's heavier in processing. It can take a toll on the device, and if a device is not meant to handle an intense amount of cryptographic IPsec uh, connections, then it'll, it might blow out. I mean, a firewall will handle it no problem. That's what it's meant to do. And just to note, I've never actually ever seen that really happen, where uh, encrypted connections caused a buffer overflow. Uh, but, you know, you never know. We're in a crazy uh, industry here. 
Okay, so that's how buffer overflows relate to IPsec. A whole bunch of intense IPsec connections might cause a buffer overflow if, if the system can't handle all those connections all at once, all those calculations all at once. Let's move to the next domain, which is actually going to be domain 5, because we started with domain 4 with IPsec, so we're just going to go to domain 5, which is identity and access management. We're going to flip through some of the pages of identity and access management. Let's just keep going to how's, oh, OK, biometrics. Um, biometrics, how does that relate to IPsec? Uh, well, I took the actual, oh, OK, I know. I took the actual CSP exam. Uh, when I took that, they made me scan in my handprint. And uh, being at the top of my CISP game uh, right then, right before the exam, I asked them what the retention policy is on the handprints, which essentially included my fingerprints as well. And they said that uh, it gets transmitted elsewhere, and then after a certain time, it gets deleted. And I bet you that the transmission medium they use to send the information elsewhere is using IPsec for securing a private data in motion to secure my private information, which is my fingerprints. Okay, that's how... It uh, how I can relate biometrics to IPsec. That was a good one, biometrics. I like that one for IPsec. Next is domain six, and we're almost done here. Just two more after this. If you're bored, I'm sorry, but I'm trying to talk about as much information as I can. I may not create a lot of specific videos about specific topics because I try not to be so rigid or structured when trying to teach uh, the CISP CBK. The CISP is a free-flowing, high-level, and a test of your cumulative knowledge on an entire eight domains of the CBK. It's good to jump around from one domain to another domain and be flexible in your studying routine and be flexible in your understanding. Then let's go to domain six and pick a random topic there. Domain six, uh, let's see, how about we flip back, flip, flip, and uh, synthetic transactions. Synthetic transaction, what the hell? Uh, I have I have no idea what this even is. What what the hell is that? What is synthetic transactions? Let me just quickly read it really quick. Many of our information. I'll pause the video so I'm not just wasting your time here. Okay, I'm back. It basically sounds like a script uh, instead of a real transaction, which is you know you 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 buy something through an online transaction that goes through many layers of merchants and credit card companies. You do that yourself. You've manually created a transaction. A synthetic transaction is one that's been done by basically writing a script. That's how I'm understanding it. How does that relate to IPsec? Uh, how does scripts and IP oh I know you know what I totally know how to relate this. For an IPsec VPN tunnel to be up and running, and if you're a network security engineer or work with uh, in operations for network security, you're probably really familiar with this. For for IPsec VPN tunnels to be up and running, there needs to be traffic traversing constantly traversing back and forth. There needs to be someone using the tunnel, basically. The, in order for a VPN tunnel to be up, someone has to be using it. Otherwise, it just goes down. It stops. It, it stops. It ceases to exist. Um, so, for example, like a pretend a application developer is using an IPsec tunnel to access some coding database across a VPN tunnel or something like that. But when this developer finishes his job and goes home for the day and stops using the VPN tunnel for his work, the tunnel can come down. It can be brought down automatically. And sometimes at my job, when there is no traffic or when the tunnel is down after being up for so long, then something is wrong. Uh, we uh, people think that something is wrong. Someone on the network side, on their side, say, "Oh, the tunnel's down. Something's wrong. Something broke. Uh, let's check this out quickly." Uh, what they don't know is that someone just, frankly, they just stop using the tunnel. They're, we just sometimes have explained to the customer that, "Hey, there's it's five, it's six thirty p.m. People in your organization have gone home, and they stopped using the tunnel, and that's why it's down." Well, the customer didn't like this idea of the tunnel being down at all, and asked us for a solution. Our solution then was to write a script a synthetic transaction that would send a continuous ping, an ICMP packet, across the VPN tunnel every five minutes or something. So th the script automatically generated uh, internet traffic to be sent across the VPN tunnel so it would look like the VPN tunnel is up at all times. Okay, So that's how a synthetic transaction relates to IPsec. We, we, it, at my job, we wrote a script to keep an IPsec VPN tunnel continuously up so it would never come down and freak out the customer. Let's move to domain seven, uh, security operations. 
and we're gonna flip to a random page in security operations, and I bet you it's gonna be it's gonna be related to IPsec because that's what a lot of security operations is really about. How about okay, yeah? Uh, how about remote access security? I may have been a little lazy on the page flipping on that one. Uh, remote access security, that's an easy one. You can use IPsec to allow your remote employees to VPN into the corporate network and can trust that their connection is going to be secure. That's really what IPsec has done for the world today for employees like me and possibly you to work from home while also working in the field of security. To be able to sometimes work from home and connect to the organization you need using a very strong encrypted media. And IPsec provides that for remote ac access security. That's an easy one. Let's go to domain domain eight software development security and see if something from there relates to IPsec. Uh, I'll try not to be too lazy on this one and try to find a flip for at least a little bit longer till I find something. How's this? <laughs> Integrated product team. Uh, how? I, I mean, I don't know what that is. It's when um, programmers and and people from other departments all get together to discuss how one application affects all their other departments at the same time. How does IPsec relate to an integrated product team? Um, maybe the developers need to hear how the value of the data by the data owner, uh, the value of the data that it holds, what classification it might have, is it confidential, is it uh, public, is it sensitive, is it private? And depending on that um, input from uh, the data owner, they can design the software to utilize IPsec or to utilize some other secure medium. It's that input that will allow them to do their job. So an integrated product team, a lot of minds, a lot of department heads get together and uh, one can learn about the function from one department to the other and IPsec could be a required function for one department that the other has to approve, create, update, or allow. That's the best I could do with integrated product team. I didn't really have a lot to work with. Okay, well, that's that's it for a cross-domain correlation video. Um, that's how, as you as you saw, that's how IPsec, it, it did. It really did relate to every other domain in, in the domains as we flipped through. And that's cross-domain correlation. Uh, during the exam, you know, if you see a question about IPsec, you can't just corner yourself and thinking, oh, this is domain four, network security, IPsec, I better just focus myself on that. No, you kind of have to branch out and see how it affects all the other domains, how one thing relates to another thing in another domain. And um, you know what, why don't I do this just to show you, and I bet it happens. I'll show you that I'm gonna search for IPsec in every single domain, and I bet you it, it, it's featured in every single domain. Okay, domain one, IPsec, bam. Uh, there's IPsec mentioned right there, okay? Domain one. Domain two, let's look for IPsec. We're in domain two, chapter two, asset security, data in motion, IPsec is mentioned right there. Domain three, do we see IPsec here? Yep, IPsec's mentioned right there again. Four, of course. Five, yep, when it comes to confidentiality, are we in chapter five? Yep, IPsec is mentioned right there. Six, sorry, this, is, this seems tedious, but I just want to prove a point. Uh, IPsec, again, in domain six right here. Domain seven, mention of IPsec? Yep, uh, no, actually. No, no mention of IPsec in domain seven, but we do see it in domain eight, which is what I was looking for. Okay, maybe domain seven doesn't have IPsec in it. Let me try internet protocol security. Okay, no, okay. Chapter seven, domain seven did not have any mention of IPsec, but what did we talk about in domain seven? I think it was like, um, ah, remote access security. So yeah, it, it definitely is in there. Okay, that's all I, that's it. That's cross-domain correlation. The more you do this, the stronger you get in your concepts, the stronger you understand what you don't understand. And, you know, you, you figure out what your strong point is, what your weak point is, and how one thing relates to everything else. I'm going to take a brave shot and say that anything, anything in any domain will relate to anything else in other domains. That's the whole point of this exam. If you can think of the high-level picture and how one thing relates to everything else. Okay? Thank you for watching.